Life Audio. Today we are continuing up our discussion that we started yesterday on the Samaritan woman. I pray that this week's study has been a blessing for you. And just a reminder, if you are behind, it's okay. If you are beyond where we're at, it's okay. This study was designed for you to go at your own pace and don't compare yourself to anybody else. Keep going. You got this. Hey friends, welcome to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? And how do you know the difference? Do you ever struggle to feel confident in your relationship with God and what He says in His Word? Do you sometimes feel stagnant or like maybe you hit a wall in your spiritual life? Hey, I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, missionary, author, pastor, and life coach, and I have been there. I too was doubting God's voice in my own life. I felt insecure about my relationship with Him, and I wanted to be obedient to what God was calling me to do, but I wasn't quite sure how to figure out what that was. I felt like I was wasting time trying to figure it out, and I just wanted a way to understand His will for my life. The answer for me was found in the pages of the scriptures, as I learned how to understand what they were actually saying. If you're ready to grow in your faith and to step confidently into the calling God has for you, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so that you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, this is the second half of our conversation that we started yesterday. If you missed yesterday's episode, I would go back and listen to that one and then come back and finish today's conversation. I love the fact that this is the longest recorded conversation in scripture we have between Jesus and another person. Did, Did you realize that? It's the longest recorded conversation we have. Number one, that doesn't surprise me because, um, I'm a, I'm a woman and I'm a talker. And, um, if Jesus was here, I'd be talking to him. But the fact that it is marked in scripture as the longest recorded conversation we have, I think is significant. Um, to me, it's evidence that Jesus speaks to women And then also, um, I think it's very significant of the posture that this woman has in society. She was in a place where she was um, not accepted by the rest of the society, the rest of the culture around her. And Jesus was in a place he, he culturally wasn't supposed to be, and he met her where she was at. And I think about those times in my own life as a woman Um, you know, at at a period of time in my life, I was a single mom. I had been divorced and regardless of the reasons for that divorce, that, like I mentioned in the book, I wore that like a stain everywhere I went, um, because I didn't have a ring on my finger, but I had a baby on my hip. And I remember going to a small group one time and it was actually, we were part of a large church. And, um, it it was actually held at the, one of the pastor's houses. And I thought, well, okay, this will be a safe place for me to go. And so I drove out there with, uh, my, my baby on one hip and my holding my, you know, toddler's hand. And, um, of course I had worked all day and tried to hurry up and get the kids something to eat. And they ate on the way and we, we get all the way out there. It was about, I don't know, 40 minutes away from where I lived. And, um, we pulled in the driveway. We were one of the first to arrive because I didn't really know exactly how long it was going to take me to get there. And as soon as I arrived, I just saw the look on the pastor's face, that whole like, oh no, she's here. And um, I didn't I didn't realize it at first, but here what it was, was this was a small group that was designed for married couples. It did not indicate that anywhere when you sm- signed up for the small groups, but that's what it was. And so they were doing a marriage study. And so um, I show up with my two kids, unmarried um, at this point, and was very uncomfortable initially just because of the content. I think no matter the, what the circumstances, I would have been uncomfortable. But as we start to gather with a small group, um, I very clearly saw that all of the wives gathered on one side of the room opposite of where I was, and all the men gathered on the other side of the room, and any time I tried to go sit down somewhere, they would move. Um it felt so hurtful. And as they started to just discuss the material, they completely skipped over me when it was my turn to share as we're going through. It was one of the most unwelcoming environments I've ever been in. And I just thought, you know what? I don't belong here. I'm going to go. 
And so I went to leave and I packed my kids up. They all watched me. Not one person said a word. I packed my kids up. I went to go put them in the car and I found that there was three other cars parked behind me. I couldn't get out. And I sat in my car and I just cried because I thought, now I got to go back in there and I got to ask these people to leave. And so I went back in and I said, I'm really sorry, um, but there's three cars parked behind me and I can't get out. And they just stared at me. Nobody said one word. Nobody, nobody said, why are you leaving? Or please don't go or please stay. It, they wanted me to go. And so they, without one word, got up, moved their vehicles, let me out. That was it. And I went to church that following week and met the eyes of that pastor in the hall. And he just looked at me and then he looked away and that was that. And I wasn't in ministry at that point. This is years before I was in ministry. And I just remember thinking like, you don't even know the circumstances around my divorce. You don't even know. And if you did, you wouldn't be treating me this way. Or at least I would hope you wouldn't be treating me this way. But it doesn't matter. It was a stain that I was wearing. There was another time I was volunteering because obviously I ended up going to a different church because I just felt so condemned at that place. Um, there was another church that I went to that a friend of mine belonged to and we were uh, serving and just starting to get involved and um, I went to go work with the youth group and I had, uh, you know, my undergrad was in youth ministry so I had started working with the youth group and one of the leaders pulled me aside and she said, you, um, have you repented? And I said, what do you mean? She said, have you repented of your divorce? You can't work with the youth unless you repent of the divorce. And I said, well, I didn't, I'm, I'm a, I'm a Christian that doesn't believe in divorce. I still don't believe in divorce. Um, and I didn't get divorced because I wanted to get divorced. I had, I had to get divorced. It was somebody else made that decision for me. And she said, well, it doesn't matter. You need to repent or you can't be here. Didn't know anything. Actually, she did know something about my circumstances. But even if she didn't, um, there's a way to treat people that are broken and hurting. And that's just not it. And so, although I have only been divorced once, um, I know what it feels like to have the circumstances dictate how the culture sees me. And I think about that when I think about this woman who went in the middle of the day when nobody else was there to gather her water. I, I've been her. I have avoided people because of the hurt that it caused me to interact with them. We're going to take a quick break right here. And when we come back, we're going to finish up our conversation of this wrap up of the Samaritan woman chapter in the She Hears Bible study. Stay tuned. Jesus meets us where we are. Even if it's a place where we don't expect him to be, where he shouldn't be, he meets us where we are. I'm so thankful for that. And, and often the very thing that separates us from everybody else is the thing that drives us to Jesus. I hope you picked up on that this week. But there's one aspect that I think is really important that I want to just touch base on. When she comes and she meets him, he asks her to put down what she's holding in the sense that she's there to draw water and he wants to offer her a different kind of water. And I think what happens is when we come to Christ, you know, there is this sense, and please don't send me an email, um, salvation is free. Absolutely. But there is a cost to salvation. There is a cost to Christ, obviously, because it, um, he, he sacrificed his life. But there's a cost to what we are called to lay down and what we are called to give up. Salvation is free. But in that process, we are called to lay down our brokenness and to lay down our sorrow and to lay down our fear and to lay down our sin. And those things often become the very things that are part of our identity and we hold on to them. Um, for so long, I was divorced single mom and I didn't know how to let go of that. Um, even after I got remarried, I still felt that stain um, that followed me around. 
because in Christian circles, well, divorce and remarriage isn't blessed. I, I'm not saying that. That's what Christian circles say. Um, so there was this idea that no matter what I did, I couldn't just shake this stain that I carried with me. And in the book, I talk about a literal stain. Um, it, it, that was just the parallel. It, there was just a literal stain I felt like I had. And that's what Jesus was asking me to give him. And I just couldn't. I mean, I would go to church and I would pray and I would do my Bible study and say, okay, Lord, take this thing away from me. Um, and maybe for you, it's not a stain of circumstances. Maybe it's a particular sin, something that you have really struggled with and you've asked God to get rid of. Um, or maybe it is a sorrow or something that you're grieving that you just can't lay down. Um, you've tried and you can't do it. I think there's a really important piece to this week that I want to make sure that you grasp. That name Messiah. In the original text, it doesn't just mean anointed to deliver, but it means to snatch away. The name Messiah means to snatch away. So the deliverer. It's not just Jesus coming and making a way where there seems to be a way. He's coming to snatch away the thing that you can't lay down. The sin you can't lay down. The sorrow you can't lay down. The stain you can't lay down. The stain of brokenness. He's He comes to snatch that away. And it's not a one-time thing. I wish it was. I wish we could just make the decision to, to hand something over to Jesus or to allow him to snatch away from us and then it's done. It's not. It's a process. That's why he talks about living water that bubbles up inside of us, that we renew and refresh as we know him and experience him and love him and speak with him. That living water is what cleans us. That's what allows us to walk with our heads held high instead of face to the ground. At the very end of the passage, we see the disciples come back. They had been gone all day. And I think it's so interesting to note that the disciples had been gone all day. They had been down in town getting food, you know, whatever they were doing, interacting with people. Obviously, if they brought food back, they interacted with some people. And when they came, came back, they came back alone. When the woman, the Samaritan woman, went down to tell people about Jesus, she drove people back to Jesus. It was her testimony that drove people to Jesus. The disciples had been in town all day. It wasn't them. God used her and her brokenness and her sorrow and her mess to drive people to him. See, we each have our own message that no one else can share. And in the context of our own community, our own circle of influence, it's our message, our testimony of how Christ transforms us that's going to drive other people to him. I want you to realize that this week, that the very things that drove you to Jesus in the first place or the very things that that you can't lay down the very things that um, you feel trapped with or you feel enslaved to those are the very things that God can use to drive others in your life to him and so this week as we're starting the a next chapter don't let go of last week I think what I want for you is to realize that these narratives throughout scripture build on each other and they paint a picture of who Jesus is. And as we read through the lens of who Jesus is, I want you to see yourself through the lens of how Jesus sees you. That's my prayer for you this week. So as you're going throughout your week, I'm praying that over you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying through this study, through the words of these scriptures, that they would be driven deep into your heart in a way that you don't forget them, that they become living water. Thank you for going on this journey with me. If you need prayer or you have questions, please do not hesitate to email me. It's rachel at shehears.org. I'm praying for you, friend. I know you've been frustrated with being confident in how to tell the difference between hearing from God and wondering if it's your own voice. Listen, I know. I've been there myself. That's why I wrote the Bible study, She Hears, Learning to Listen to Jesus. This is a six-week study that takes you through the book of John, looking at six women in the life of Jesus. It also teaches the color method of Bible study, which helps you to learn how to really understand the scriptures. 
I include lots of cultural and historical information, and it really makes these familiar passages of scripture just come alive. This is a great study to do on your own, to do with some girlfriends or even some teenage girls, and it will help you really gain the confidence in how to hear from the Lord and set you up with some tools that will stay with you long after the study is over. You can find that on my resources page at shehears.org, where there are also some really good resources to help you in your spiritual growth. I pray that they are a blessing for you. I want to take just a second to thank the team at Life Audio for their partnership with us on the podcast. If you go to lifeaudio.com, you'll find dozens of other faith-centered podcasts in their network. They've got shows about prayer, Bible study, parenting, and more. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you for God's call in your life, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you this week. Know that you are loved, you are cherished, and you are His.